It's Friday, the 10th of April, 2020, COVID crisis, gonna do some drawing, gonna do some drawing. Here we go. What do we got today for you ladies and gentlemen? We have some fan art of a YouTuber named Grantham, and he is doing a review of the DSA OSW. Not important what those acronyms are, maybe I'll get into it later. DS Arms, Operational Specialist Weapon. I like drawing commandos, so it's full auto Friday. We're going to get into some drawing some commandos. This is a screenshot I lifted from his video this week. And we are going to draw from this. And what we're going to talk about is uh, weapon firearm design, commando pose, and folds on this arm. I think this is a really good example of how to do folds and upper body garments along with the plate carrier. So if you're designing artwork for a video game, like a Counter-Strike game or a Call of Duty game, you're going to have guys like this. And we're going to talk a little bit about the equipment, the little details that are going on here, all while getting that background. There's some really interesting stuff in the reference here too, including how the smoke coming off of the gun range is uh, is starting to force the background into the distance. The camera operator who composed this shot also used a camera lens with a narrower depth of field so that the subject in the foreground is in focus and the background is blurry. And as we paint a copy of this scene, we'll demonstrate how that's effective at bringing foreground, background kind of stuff all going in together. Let me check the stream, make sure it's going. Looks like it's going pretty well. And I got maybe two people watching already. Fascinating. I guess maybe that one of those two people is me and another person. Maybe L. Maybe you. Who are you? Tell me who you are who is watching. I would love to know who is watching this video right now. So let's take Grantham, move him over here. I believe he is a active duty Air Force commando specialist kind of guy. He does gun reviews for fun. Companies send him guns. And then he does some really good video of him demonstrating their usefulness. On a gun range. And we will do some drawing based on this. So I apologize. I had waited to, I was hoping that the lawnmower people would be done by now. It seems they're still working. So we got to fight through some sound effect from outside. Get okay, massing in. We got the foreground guy just going to do a big, big, big kind of broad shape for his massing. Got mass conception of the arm, the forearm, and then where the hand is going, something like that. We draw a line just for the firearm, and this makes for a really good composition. This firearm in particular is based off of the Fissieu Automatique Leger of Belgium, but it is a highly modified version by an American company called DSA to make it much shorter and more compact with some modern components. The original firearm, I think, was designed in the 50s uh, for NATO trials back in the day. And it had a much longer barrel, popular in uh, not only Europe, but Africa and South America as well. Famously uh, seen on both sides of the conflict of the Falkland Islands War between England and Argentina back in the 80s. Long before most of my viewers were alive, fascinating uh, modern conflict, uh, Cold War, like maybe post Cold War, end of the Cold War kind of thing. So these straps are actually going to be higher. I, I misdrew those already. But we're just starting to draw so that we can mass in and figure out where all our shapes are, uh, and then that way, when we know where our shapes are, we can start thinking about composition. I'm caffeinated. I'm fed this morning. I got like six hours of sleep. Played some Zelda last night, had some good times. We had a fun time yesterday drawing a Korok uh, airplane thing based on Zelda and Howard Hughes, a really interesting collaboration. So we are going to continue on our productive week drawing a little bit. It was nice to take off on Wednesday. I did some hiking with my friend Steve. Social distancing, of course. Keeping our distance from ourselves and the wildlife while enjoying nature and some fresh air. Um, I recommend you get some fresh air if it's not too cold where you are today. Even if it is a little cold, get outside, 
uh, do something for yourself, that's good. I'm noticing this hand, we'll get into it later, but it's actually twisted. It's not totally profile to the camera. Neither is the rifle. Even though the gun looks like it's profile, it's pretty close to profile, but there's going to be a couple elements, a couple areas where we're seeing two sides and not just one. And we'll just kind of remember that. Mostly on the end where we have a little curvature on the end of the muzzle. So a little background about me. I've been a digital artist for 20 years. I went to school at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. I worked in the game industry for 15 years and I contract and do other things. Now, uh, I, for hobbies, I enjoy videography and illustration and competitive shooting is one of the things. I like learning about marksmanship and military history. So that's why I'm a little bit more familiar with some of these components and hopefully that translates into making a better drawing. Um, I like telling my students that I've taught before, draw something that you love, you're going to care about it more, and then the details will be more correct. Draw things from your own life. Share the human experience from your own perspective. Uh, it's going to feel the best. It's going to be the most real. It's going to be the most educated. Uh, if you want to push yourself out and explore sharing stories from other cultures and other places, absolutely do it. Absolutely do it. But know that your strongest work is probably going to be the ones that you're most familiar with. For sure, for sure. So I think everyone can tell, everyone has a story of their own that can tell. I actually appreciate journalists more because they're the ones that are going out and are telling other people's stories. They're good storytellers who know how to collect information. So we have a little bit of the massing of the guy in the foreground here. Let's create another layer underneath. We'll dim down Grand Thumb. We'll just call it GT for short. Then we will quickly get the background colors kind of painted. It. I'm going to sample in this background and see what it is. It looks like it's a light orange. It's kind of a creamsicle color. And as we paint it down, it feels very white, especially against this green. There's some color theory at work here. If this was flat gray, let's just point some flat gray down. You can see how cool this green feels compared to flat gray, and then how warm that um, background feels compared to the flat gray. But against the green, it just feels plain white. Very interesting how color theory will come to work uh, as we keep going. So we're going to take that pink. We're going to increase the pinkness. I actually like that it feels more pink, so I'm going to lean into that using my West Coast lingo. Lean into this thing. I think that's a great phrase that's come out in the last two, three years, when you see people leaning into stuff, I think that's a good good thing. Uh, next, I'm feeling that these are some uh, green trees back there, but as I sample the color, I'm seeing a blue. How interesting is that? I'm thinking green, sampling blue. So if I make that mark, doesn't that feel green? That mark feels green to me, doesn't it? Does it feel green to you? It's a dark blue. It's a dark gray blue. Very interesting. You know, it's more on the green spectrum than like a deep navy or something, but that's all we get. We're going to mass in some shapes of these trees, and then we're going to fuzzy up the outside of them just to get something. So when, when, I'm, when I'm massing in trees, I don't really, it's hard to think about the silhouette of the tree because it's such a fuzzy random shape. It's a little easier to start with the trunk for me and then build shapes off of that. It seems more alive. You can get some directionality. So that's what I would prefer usually to do. So I'm gonna lightly glaze over this whole blue area, pick my dark tree color again, and then uh, construct my tree starting with the trunk and then building the shape off of it using my brush that I, I made. It's kind of like horsehair, analogous marking device. So making some hasty marks to get it started. That's going to be a little bit sparser at the top so we can sample the background color, paint over it, paint in some negative space. That's a good thing to do. It mixes up the brush marks. It's more exciting for the eye to look at, more than just one consistent and obvious layer. Going back and forth between the background color and foreground color, I think is a good way to go. You have some kind of concrete. Uh, there's a concrete 
or tan box. It's like a Connex trailer or something like that behind Mr. Grantham here. For you that are wondering, Grantham, what does Grantham mean? For those who aren't shooters, the Grantham is a side effect of using an M1 Garand World War I rifle. And they would use the charging handle to lock it back and then grab a new clip of bullets, clip, N block clip of eight rounds, shove that in top of the gun to feed it. And then sometimes if you put those rounds in, it would unlock the cocking handle and it would close the bolt on the thumb, giving you like a, a bruise and like an abrasion on the back of your thumb as your thumb gets pinned between two metal surfaces under force. And that was called the Garand thumb. Now this guy in particular, I believe, is a fan of the M1 Garand. It was one of the things he first started competing in. And, uh, maybe it was civilian marksmanship program where you're able to get surplus M1 Garands from the Great War and use them for marksmanship for NRA matches or something like that. Uh, so he had one of those and his first videos, now he's a very popular YouTuber with a million subscribers, but when he started he was just a you know, kid in the backyard shooting his M1 Garand, I think, or in a you know, range setting. I think he was a young officer or a young enlisted uh, in the Air Force, and this was something he did as a hobby, was shooting Garands. And I guess Garand thumb is a little ironic because it's a mouth. It's something that you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to operate a rifle in a way that hurts you. <laughs> so uh, it's, maybe it's a little humble to say, like, he's somebody who's messed up a lot or had this happen to him a lot. It'd be like, uh, it's kind of like saying broken leg in theater. Like, go break a leg. If, you don't, if you're not in theater, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you, why does breaking limbs have anything to do with being on stage? Well, it's like the worst thing that can happen. The show must go on. If you're dancing, your leg just snaps. Uh, you're supposed to complete the show. So it's, it's like an ironic opposite well wish. Like, you don't want it to happen, but they're ironically and sarcastically saying to do it in a way it's, it's it's come to become a way of wishing somebody luck. So I'll, interestingly, as I'm painting this thing and talking, I've made the left side darker than the right side, whereas in the picture, we see that the background that's further away from us is going to be lighter. So you see how suddenly in the, in the drawn part, the middle section of trees feels like it's closer than the other section of trees just by the color. So this is a quick demonstration of how that kind of works. Accidental, but still you can learn from anything. So how would I want to reverse this again? Well, I could pick the darker color and then just paint over stuff I have in the foreground and then I'll, that'll fix it. So I'll just go over it again. Look at some more of the shapes. We have this one and then it kind of blends it into a mass over here. And let's paint in, I like that uh, little negative shape there. And so it's good to look at the hollows in the trees along with where the leaves of the trees are. I think both of those things together works out pretty well. So we'll keep that in the foreground there. So we'll see the background. So for the background stuff, let me just take that lighter color and then glaze over these trees just a little bit. When I say glaze, I mean lightly press on the brush. I'm using less force in my hand to mark. Whereas if I use more pressure, more of that ink will come down and it'll be more opaque. More opaque of a mark. Suddenly, so just having some light shapes on top of dark shapes, those light shapes being smaller, gives some volume to that background. So that's kind of a fun background. Now, if I want to make this thing feel fuzzy and in the distance, either I can rope select it and Gaussian blur, or maybe a little bit more fun, I'm going to use the smudge tool in Photoshop. And I'm just going to push and pull in direction with, with where those branches and leaves are going. I can address the strength here. I'm just going to leave it at 40% and just quickly kind of wiggle my my pen across the canvas. Just kind of give it a little, little shimmy shimmy. There was a way to use different brushes in the past. I don't know where that is now. It might be some kind of control. So I'm just going to wiggle it back and forth. I can push and pull and add a little bit of shape. I can shrink the pen size by using my bracket controls and just pulling that up and down and do my best impression of a Bob Ross voice as I calmly make gentle marks. I could increase the percentage to 80% and then start to pull little branches and leaves in different directions as I increase the pressure sensitivity 
and pressure power of this brush. Let's go back to 30% and continue our mark making. Doesn't this make you happy? It feels like you're doing something. You're at home, you're unproductive today, and you can get into Photoshop and take a perfectly clear image and just start smudging it. And suddenly, you'll feel more productive and empowered and ready to conquer the world because you, with your hand, have enacted the powers of God and changed the surrounding around you. So, that was fun. We can keep doing that. We can go back to our normal Tom voice and continue the rest of this tutorial. I think that is a good idea. Yes, I'm glad to hear that you agree. We will continue. On the right, you have some brown. We have a big dirt mount. If you're at a gun range uh, outside, you will tend to see giant piles of dirt. Why is this? Well, dirt stops bullets. And you don't want people just launching rounds willy-nilly uh, into the farm, into the neighbor's field, even though um, you know I might have been guilty of doing that every once in a while. There's something called ricochets. You can shoot around into, into a surface, and that bullet will bounce um, occasionally. You can hit a rock, or just by the sheer velocity of it slamming into some dirt, or even a puddle. Shooting into water is very dangerous because water, that tensile surface strength, has a lot to do with velocity. Depending on how hard an object hits the surface of the water is whether that water will break and allow the object to get into the, into the body of water, or whether that surface will remain intact. And you might as well be hitting concrete. What's going on? What's going on there, Sean? Thanks for hopping in today. Glad to hear you said uh, happy to watch you work on trees. They're a trouble spot for me. Also, nice hat. Yes, I'm glad you like the Vortex stuff representing Midwest uh, American companies, even though they use Japanese products. I do like the Vortex brand. I think I've gotten like four of these hats, all given, all free from different matches I've done. 22 Precision Match, sponsored by Vortex. Got a couple of uh, their hats. The only Vortex product I bought is a spotting scope that I've been using to look at the moon and stars and spotting from, and it's a 22 power scope with an 85 millimeter objective and that thing is awesome. It was going to be my co-host today and I forgot to bring it upstairs. I might get it later and do a mini review, but I love that thing. It's super cool and it's convinced me maybe I need to get a pair of Vortex binoculars someday. Also, I'm channeling my inner Joe Rogan. Joe is a famous podcaster and comedian, of course, and host of Fear Factor and Ultimate Fighting sometimes. UFC, he's been rocking the Vortex hat lately. He's got a few of those Vortex. I don't know if they're paying him or if he's just a, a sponsor of the brand. I know Joe Rogan is an avid hunter, but a bow hunter, so he's probably not using... The rifle optics. He might. I don't, he might have a rifle. I'm not really sure, but I know he's probably got some vortex binoculars because those binos are legit. Uh, Sean, I don't know how far. Oh yeah, you said you're not near uh, the northern, uh, central part of this United States. But when I was out driving through Wisconsin, I got to stop at the headquarters in outside of Madison and look at all their beautiful binoculars and spotting scopes and rifle scopes. And I think they have a couple things for archery too, little like mountable kind of optic things that you can put on your compound bow. And that is fun. Uh, so maybe that's what maybe that's what he's getting into. In this reference photo, it looks like there's some kind of lens distortion here. This color field is so distinct. Yeah, there's green and blue stuff in the background, and because I don't have the video right here to play back, I can't see if that was from the smoke. Maybe it's a rainbow effect. Let me, maybe I'll cue up that video and see if that's where that's coming from, because that'll educate us as to the nature of that highlight. So, let's see. Let's see, let's see. Sorry, we got the we got the weed whacker outside going kind of nutty. Right, let's watch let's watch Grantham do his do his thing. Real quick, real quick. Let's put that over. Oh my goodness. That's not what I wanted. I want theater mode. Yes, that's what I want. I don't want people seeing my recommendations because then they'll know how much of a gun nut I am to see all the videos. So we're watching Garand thumb right now doing some transitions. 
So when he fires this thing, we see a big cloud of smoke, but not a lot of fire. And in, the, in, the, in my experience in the daytime, you really have to have an egregious uh, muzzle device or something for a fireball. So I'm looking at what, what is this green field? I have no idea. Is that some just a little bit of grass that's there? So when it was blurry, it was hard to see. It looks like maybe it's grass on the side of the berm. Yeah, okay. It's little clumps of grass. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. This is a good demonstration of that offset optic. You might be wondering, what is this little, little bitty bit right in front? You have the main scope, you have a laser pointing device for night vision use, and then you have this other tiny optic, and that would be a reflex red dot canted at a 45 degree angle. So if he doesn't want to get behind the scope because it takes longer to get behind the scope, it might be faster to rotate the gun over and see if a little red dot that's over on the side like this. For you video gamers who play shooter games, you know what a red dot is. For those people who are just friends and family of mine who have no idea about how guns and optics work, a red dot would be a little tube with and it would look something like that. And then there would be suspended in the middle of the tube a little dot. And that would be where the aiming location is. And that's much easier to aim than using a traditional iron sight system, which would look more like by your eyes would be a pair of two posts. And at the end of the rifle would be a single post. And you would line up this post with the tops of these two posts. And then that's how you would aim the gun. Or it would be a circle, like a peep sight. And then you have this front post somewhere in there and you put that front post right in the middle of that peep and that's how you aim. So that, with a traditional scope getting your eyeball exactly behind that circle and the crosshair being perfectly in the middle sometimes is more complicated to get to. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to find the right eye, eye location trying to find out where your eye is because there's scope shadow and you can't really see things so you're moving around a little bit. Red dot, big field of view, the little dot right in the middle, a little easier to find. And see. So that's what that's all about. Let's keep drawing. Let's keep drawing. As you guys turned in, you want to get entertained? You want to get entertained? Glad Sean's watching today. All right. So we'll put a little greener there because we, we're assuming this is no grass. I'm, grass in my mind is a yellowish a uh, sage green color, but in this scene, what is that color? It's bluish again. We got that blue. I want to say that this footage has probably been color corrected for artistic reasons by the editor. I don't know if Grantham himself, I imagine he has a partner who does the videography and editing for him. So we have some darker oranges and reds mixed in between the lighter dirt colors and then that's fine. So sometimes it's fun if you have more time to look at an image and try to pick that color yourself. That's a really good way to learn. For the expediency of this demo I am going to usually pick the color that exists and then draw it down and then adjust as creatively necessary. So this is pretty good start. Let's go with the soft round brush just to fill in uh, the rest of the area here. This is good. This is good. And then we'll put a little bit more of the background. I don't know. Just down through the middle. Cool. So this is enough to get us started with the background there. I want to, I want this area just to be a little bit darker. I might pick that whole Connex box thing and then use a soft round brush, a little darker gray, and just lightly airbrush in just on the bottom to shadow. And that would be our ambient inclusion. That would be the edges of our of the universe that aren't collecting light from the sky box around us. Sky box dome uh, box is the term from video games because boxes are simple, simpler to render than spheres, six sides versus a million or something, thousands. So the, the, the dome of the lighting environment that we find ourselves in, be it the sun, the sky, the clouds, everything bouncing light off of us. I'm looking outside right now and I'm seeing a mostly cloudy sky with a couple poked holes of blue.
which is nice. Which is nice. Let's readjust the head shape apparatus. What's going on, Savannah? So happy to see you join us today. I hope you are having a wonderful afternoon with your family. You're not getting too cabin feverish. Appreciate your ZBrush demos. All right, let's draw the let's draw the guy here, and we're going to do a little bit of an outside contour drawing. First of all, I'm going to dim the background a little bit, or um, create a layer in between. Dimming is good because it gives me more contrast. So I have a general idea of what my background is, but I can focus on the line work. So getting re re reducing that contrast, bringing my sketch back to the foreground. Let's increase that percentage back up again. And I'm going to work the silhouette with a, let's do a hard round brush, consistent, constant, dark line. And that way we can just quickly bang out a really cool silhouette. So uh, with some detail, I'm going to be using the eraser tool E with the same brush and B to draw and I like using these two simple tools because it constricts how much you can do. It's just very direct, very immediate, and you can make decisions really fast. Nose. So we're seeing that his mouth is hidden by the stock of the rifle. Now as we draw this, we might need to move stuff around. Stock is a tubular shape. It's got an upper tube and a lower tube it comes in at a bend. And after we make each detail, we'll see if that makes sense with the whole figure. It's very easy if you don't go to a constructed method of drawing. If you just go to this contour method to get things out of shape and out of proportion, but because we're in Photoshop, it's easy to undo and change what we're doing. Where's the cuff of the elbow? The elbow is quite foreshortened. Look, look how thick his elbow is. It's about as thick as his head. And that's because it's a little closer to the camera. So where does that elbow line line up? Where that crease is is probably in line with the ear protection. So either his head can come forward a little bit, which I think it should move his head forward or the arm would go back but in this case head forward nose is coming over the crease in the stock very good when I've been shooting I've been talking your nose to the back of the upper receiver it's a little alarming for people who have never shot guns before because your face is so close to this thing that's exploding and moving but once you learned it that the impact isn't so bad if you're mounting the rifle correctly the absorption of the, the stock into your shoulder will hold it in place and you get used to it. it's not moving enough to punch you it's just moving a little bit right so that's what he's doing he's getting his nose pretty close to the receiver there let's get that silhouette of that shape I love all these little details so we have the edge of the scope this I believe is an Elcan Spectre 1.5 to 6 power scope and it just flips from 1.5 to directly to 6. It isn't a increasing scope like your traditional rifle scope that goes all the way through the power range. This one just has a flip. There's a prism inside the middle of this scope that changes the lens uh, that the user is seeing through. Negative space there. Where we have the 1913 rail. This device that the device on most modern rifles that scopes and lasers and flashlights attach to. We have this little reflex red dot count kind of offset mounted on that same bit of rail. We have handguard, ejection port where the cases come out of after they've been fired. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Receiver. So there's the, the mounting plate on top of the gun where the 1913 rail is then we have the upper receiver part of the FAL is this shape and 
that is the serialized part of the firearm. It's what's registered with the gun store when it's been sold. It's what has the serial number stamped on it. And then the lower is where the trigger group is and the stock is assembled too. So we have this one big part in the back and it, it kind of comes across and down here, but the hand is gonna be blocking it. So the hand kind of comes up midway to that lower bit. This is the knuckle here. And then we have this arcing shape. Now we're actually seeing a little bit of the bottom of the hand here. And we're seeing a bit, if we were to mass construct the forearm, this would be the Mackey line, which is the, the Mackey line in art is the edge between the lit and the shadow part. So if I held my hand here, the Mackey line would be this. You see the light, light coming in from outside and then the shadow here. You can very quickly say a lit side and a shadow side. And it's up to you to define where that line is, but that's just a, a, a concept. Um, wow, it's awesome. Very cool, very, very, very cool. Very, very cool. Uh, gotten some messages from friends regarding COVID stuff. Someone I haven't talked to in a very long time who I found was also a fish fan. I messaged my friend Jennifer from high school. Very cool to hear from her. And I was like, oh, awesome. We both like the same stuff. Cool, let's reconnect. I've been having a lot of fun watching fish's live streams. Uh, so uh, give me a little bit of joy during this pandemic. I can't wait till we're all vaccinated and healthy again and we can go to concerts and see some live music. Because a fish show is just a happy place. No one's upset at a fish show. Everyone's having a good time. I mean, there are those people that have taken too many drugs and need to be hauled out on stretchers. That they're, Ladies and gentlemen, kid, boys and girls, don't do too many drugs. Don't, don't do a lot of drugs. Unless prescribed by your doctor, I think. Or if you just want to say, uh, hey, government, I'm not listening to you. But I think drugs in general are not a good thing until you're old enough to know what you're doing or something. I shouldn't be talking about this. I shouldn't be talking about it. We're going to talk more about firearms, a less controversial subject than drugs. <laughs> and how to draw commandos. That was a little ironic. Let's keep going here. What are we doing? What are we doing? Next we have the PEC-15, which is a laser aiming module in the front. I think it's a 15. Maybe it's a 13. And you might say, what is this sci-fi looking device out in front and why does it matter? Well, for these Uber Commando people that we have in our military, they like to work at night because America is a rich country that can afford $20,000 of nighttime enhancement optical equipment for each soldier and that gives us a huge advantage on the battlefield whereas most of our opponents cannot afford uh, equipment like that or they can't afford to logistically operate it which means batteries electrical stuff training um, all that goes into it this module itself is probably around thousand fifteen hundred bucks but to really take advantage of it you need a ten thousand dollar pair of night vision binoculars or just monocular optic on top of it adds weight to the front of the gun what it does is it has an aimable laser that is uh, zeroed to the rifle by the user and at night time there is an infrared beam that can be fired off the front of the gun and it gives people with goggles a ability to aim when they can't get those goggles behind the scope itself so it's like laser tag, where you can see the beam as you're shooting it. Now they're seeing a beam, but the bullet is actually going to be following next to the beam in parallel. There's also typically a visible laser that is slaved to the same zeroing process as the infrared laser. And sometimes, I don't know in the pack, it looks like it has it, an illuminator. It's like a laser flashlight or an infrared flashlight that can illuminate things outside of the human visual spectrum, but in a spectrum of light that the commandos can see. What's up, L? Welcome to the stream. So happy you're here with us. Gave you the heads up. Glad you're here now, man. We're drawing commando guys today because it's full auto Friday. 
Full Auto Friday here in the Tom household. So, uh, getting the forehand is always something I skimp on when I'm drawing from my head. So, using this reference today, I'm I'm seeing the subtleties of Grand Thumb's fingering here. It actually looks like that's the pinky finger back here, is the the thin one, and then the ring finger goes up a little bit higher, and then the middle finger comes lower, and the index is is bent and out. So we're seeing the silhouette of the index finger. So he's holding it like, like the, the hand's doing something like that as it's supporting the foreend of the rifle. And then we have a silhouette before the magazine, the silhouette of the glove. It's got a Velcro strap that holds his shooting glove down. Now gloves are useful on the forehand, on the support hand when you're shooting because things get hot in front. Especially a gun like the FAL has a piston system external to the inner workings of the gun where there is gas being topped off the end of the barrel brought into a piston chamber that is driving a mechanical piston that's driving the cycling of the action. When that gas comes off the barrel into the piston chamber, it's that pressure is turning into heat and it's going to heat up that front of the gun and then that's why it's a good reason to wear some gloves because you can get pretty hot. After a couple hundred rounds, that thing is scorching. You can start to sizzle some bacon on the end of these rifles. Not every rifle is like that, but the FAL is certainly one of those that will do that. Start to cook that bacon. So we got our Pack 15 in front. Next we have the magazine here. Magazine well is the shape that holds the magazine. And then there's a little magazine release tab there. The magazine is what holds the bullets. And it is used in military history for kind of anything that holds ammunition. You know, you might go down to Fort McHenry in Baltimore to see where the Battle of Baltimore happened in 1813, 1812. During the Battle of the War of 1812, the British came in and tried to take Baltimore. And there was this big naval battle that happened between the fort. And uh, it was mostly an impotent battle. Like, no kills were recorded on either side. Like, the British lobbed shells at the fort. It was raining, so a lot of the shells didn't go off. And then the fort shot back at the British. And the British were like, this war is stupid. We're not going to really risk any of our ships of the line here. We're just going to try to harass Baltimore and let these stupid colonists know what's up. But the British had actually landed in an infantry force. And them rowdy Dundalkins 200 years ago... Cap, Captain Officer busted a cap in him, shot him in the face. Some sniper from Dundalk, Maryland, came out and popped a British red coat as he was on his horse addressing his infantry. And the British were like, we had enough of this business. We ain't going to war with these crazy colonists. We're not, we're not hanging out in this swamp any longer. Let's get back on the boat and get out of here. So they decided to shell Baltimore. It didn't work out very well. Baltimore, you know Baltimore. Baltimore knows how to protect itself. It also knows how to hurt itself, but it also, you know, I wouldn't mess with Baltimore, man. If I was like an army, I'm not invading Baltimore, man. I'm going all the way around Baltimore. I might siege it, uh, but I'm not going to be going to be going house by house clearing Baltimore. God, that's a terrible idea. That's a terrible idea. You know, it would have been smart before we invaded Iraq in 2003 to tell the army to like, all right, we're going to do a drill. We're going to see how it would work in Baltimore. So we're going to get, <laughs> we're going to take like part of West Baltimore, clear it out, <laughs> give everybody Nerf guns, and let's do a test and let's see how hard and how long it would take for First Infantry to go through and uh, clear all the quote unquote terrorists out of an urban center like Baltimore with the, the amount of illegal gun ownership in Molotov cocktails and rowdiness here and that would probably give, have given us a much better idea of what we were going to be going into in Fallujah in 2006. God, I feel, you know, much uh, respect to veterans who went over and did that, did that house to house fighting and clearing and from the stories I read it was just absolutely brutal. Sean here has uh, done some games based on it, I think. Didn't you do a Fallujah game? Sean, you designed something like that. That's cool, man. So we got two kind of garments this guy's wearing, too. Or is it just one garment that's folded? It's the 
desert nighttime camo pattern that has been flipped to the outside. There's a daytime pattern and then there's a nighttime pattern in the same garment. And depending on how you're wearing it, it's for one or the other. This plaid that he's got on is the nighttime look. So it's generally like a cool green that has a light and a dark side and then there's some mixed shapes. I heard that does pretty well with infrared. What do, what do I know? Okay, I want to get this guy going. I don't want to spend too much time here today. I got to play video games and I got to do some 3D modeling and I got to do a Skype call and another meeting and all kinds of all kinds of business today. So we got the hand. I'm feeling pretty good about the forearm. Remember there's this negative space underneath where his chin is. And I'm just going to leave that open. There's a lot of digit there's a lot of noise going on in there. I'm I'm seeing that where my receiver is and where his wrist is, the wrist is actually a bit longer. So I'm going to move the break of the wrist back just a hair, make the, the hand longer so that it lines up with the components of the. So that's the rear sight notch there. This arcing shape is the rear sight. And then there's the mounting hardware for a foldable stock. This stock can be folded and collapsed for transport. And that's why it's called the paratrooper model, because it's designed to fold for people that are in airplanes and they're free falling. You don't if you're in, if you're jumping out of an aircraft as a commando, you're not gonna want a really long rifle that can um, impact the ground and slam into it and break and bend and all that kind of stuff. You want something shorter that can fold up either going backpack or a musette bag or something else that can be transported a little bit easier and is a little less ungainly. So that's what that's all about. Folding stock. Folding stock. What's the down? Why aren't all stocks folding? Well, you lose some rigidity. You lose some strength. If you want to kick in a door, like bash in a door with your rifle, you're not going to want to do it with a folding stock because there's now a weak point between the stock and the receiver of the rifle at that joint. Anywhere you add a joint, you, you lose strength, right? You lose strength. I mean, how many? What's the most common injury in the NFL? Probably torn knees, right? Ligaments, MCLs, ACLs, ankle injuries are super common. I messed my ankles up. So block shoulders, you're not breaking the bones, you're ripping tendons because those are all at joints. That connective tissue is kind of like the, the rotational areas of metal. You know, anywhere you have a cut, it's going to be weaker, right? It's going to be weaker. You all know this. It's intuitive. Sometimes I just got to spell it out for you, though. People in my head are like, what are you talking about, Tom? People in my head are like, I think you need to go into better detail about why joints are weaker than rigid bones. Well, I'm no physicist. I'm not Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm not going to go into it. You can go YouTube that. You can go look that up for yourself. And we love folds here. We love folds here in the Turbo Simons, Tom Simons, whatever you want to call it, channel, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitch, someday. Someday, Nate Lindbergh, I will be on your platform. Hasn't happened yet. I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of it. I'm scared right now of Twitch. So all those comments. Afraid of learning new stuff. Facebook I'm familiar with. YouTube I'm familiar with. I'll get into the Twitch game. I love me some Dr. Disrespect on Twitch. Love it. But I also like his highlights on YouTube. It's a little faster, a little easier to get into. All right, let's be good. Silhouette of it looks like a bit of a hood, a hooded thing that's kind of wrapped up and folded back there. And then what is he wearing? This is a plate carrier, ladies and gentlemen. It is a harness that goes around your upper body. Its primary goal is to hold armor plate to protect the vital organs of the user. I could do a whole history lesson about the history of body armor going back to like medieval era or the Romans like 2,000 years ago the Romans with their Lorica Segmentata or their that steel, steel armor that's famous with the helmet steel helmet and all this kind of stuff and chain mail and the Vikings and then we had the, the heavy armed people in the Eastern Roman Empire and you have the samurai and the Chinese and plates and and chain mail and then then arrows and then crossbows to learn to penetrate that stuff and gunpowder bullets just started zinging right through that plate metal and they realized over time 
that if you just keep putting more and more plate metal on people, they get so heavy that they can't move. So there's a weight to strength ratio. So body armor was abandoned during the Great Wars because to stop a bullet was going to take too much armor, it would stop people from moving. So then you had the invention of the tank. You had motorized gun carriages, motorized weapons platforms that can carry that much armor to protect themselves against gun bullets. And then guns got bigger and faster and louder. Bullets started going faster to penetrate those pieces of metal. And it was an arm race between armor and weapons that could over-penetrate, under-penetrate each other. Now, body armor came back in the modern era with the invention of ceramic body armor. They have figured out a way to keep um, body weight down with the inclusion of ceramics that are brittle but strong. They can take an impact and then they distribute the impact laterally instead of directly through. So it's more catching the round and then distributing it horizontally, the energy horizontally, instead of it letting it penetrate. Kevlar was a big invention to that. I think it was invented by a lady too. Uh, Kevlar was a wonderful invention that was used in the 60s uh, for flak jackets, uh, I believe, and also for stretchers. It was a lightweight, strong material that could hold a lot of energy, could hold a lot of stuff. So these plate carriers, they used to have, like these chest rigs and plate carriers used to have Kevlar in them. Now, not so often do you see Kevlar in them. They're just a ceramic plate or a metal plate with a liner of some kind, something that is designed to catch direct impacts and distribute the energy outward to the side. You know, it still hurts getting hit by a bullet, but it's not gonna kill you. And they decided that to save a life, you know, weight to strength ratio, it's, I guess it's best just to have a plate in the front, a plate in the rear, protecting your vital organs like your heart and some of your lungs, most of your lungs. And then they decided, so since we're already carrying this piece of equipment on our chest, how about we put some of our magazine pouches on top of there? So in front of that plate, armor plate, will be a place for the user to mount pouches where they can hold more bullets. We used to call that web gear because there was webbing. They used nylon webbing, which you might know from stitching or making clothes or something like that. It's that backpack strappy stuff is nylon webbing. This is what your backpack straps are made out of. And talented clothing designers or like military equipment designers would make patterns of webbing, again, in a strength to weight ratio where it wouldn't be too heavy, but it's strong enough to carry the 10 to 30 pounds of ammunition and water that every soldier uh, needs to carry on their person. Typical combat load, I think it's 270 rounds of 5.56 ammunition. If it was 30 cal, 308 bullets like this guy's carrying, you might have 120 rounds, maybe 150 rounds of that. It's pretty heavy ammo. They're, the bullets are pretty big, man. Pretty big, pretty heavy. So he's got one magazine, this looks like a 30 rounder in the gun right there. Then I would assume he'd have three or four more magazines on his chest rig and uh, probably battle belt. Down on the lower corner of his kit, you see something labeled TQ. That would be for a tourniquet in case he gets a massive bleed from combat. You want a tourniquet to apply to your forearms, to your upper arm, your leg, to stop bleeding in an extremity injury. Okay, back to dude's uh, profile here. I'm gonna go with a slightly smaller brush. Let's do a pressure sensitive brush that goes thinner, the lighter I draw, and thicker, the heavier I draw. And we're gonna detail up his face a little bit. So what are we seeing here? We have the ear protection, Let's use the same brush for our eraser so we can get big and small. There is a plastic shield and then the metal adjustment bit. His hair is getting a little long, but that's fine for him. Loosening up the grooming standard as the COVID rips its way through society. Grooming standard being a military thing. He's a, I believe he's still active duty or reserve something. Still in the forces. So you usually have to keep your hair cut. You see a bit of his eye. His eye seems to be wide open. He is engaging targets with speed. 
Dude's nose is pretty long for his face. I think he's just very thin. He's a very thin guy, very trim, great physical condition. So, you know, his nose might seem bigger because he doesn't have the jowls and the beard and all this business that I got going on. So my nose looks smaller in relation to all this volume. He, I have a huge head, huge head. Headphones, hat, glasses, all this stuff around my face makes my nose seem smaller. But if I was, if I was Christian Bale thin, you know, that nose is going to look bigger because the rest of the face gets small. That's how it works. Proportions, relativity. You know, Einstein was right. Relativity is very important. Got a little bit of a mustache kind of thing going. One of my favorite characters in war movies is that, that like CIA guy from Sicario with the glasses on. Like the nerd commando, I think is a really interesting looking dude. I forget what the character's name is, but I like him. I like him a lot. Dudes with glasses can be lethal. They can be villains. They don't have to all be eggheads. I'm trying to think. Is there a name of villain that wears glasses? Is Boris from Goldeneye? It's kind of a villain. Question for today. Name a villain from a popular movie or TV show, mainstream, that wears glasses. Ooh, there was that Bond movie with Pierce Brosnan where the where the British the Irish guy has glasses. He's the news media overlord dude. I think it was There's one that took place in China, in Hong Kong. I mean, a lot of them will take place in Hong Kong. Die Another Day? I think it's Die Another Day, because Madonna did the soundtrack. Guess I'll die another day. I guess I'll die another day. Die Another Day villain? No, that's a different movie. Um, die Another Day is the one that takes place in North Korea. Hmm. Then what's the one I'm thinking of? James Bond. Uh, it was one of the stealth sh boat. It's one of the stealth ship in it. Sea Dolphin Two. Elliot Car. Wait, Elliot Carver was the villain. Played by. Yes. One of the boat this guy. That guy, that dude, he's got glasses. That's one of the few villains I can think of that's got glasses on his face. What's this dude's name. He's been in a lot of movies. I loved him in Ronin. And there we have Pierce Brosnan looking all sexified, handsome man. He ain't taking no BS. He's got a great handgun. He's got a SIG M11. SIG 227, I believe it is. Well, James Bond has an HK MP5, and it looks like an FN. Actually, no, it's not. I thought it was a 5.7 at first, but probably USP or something. Can't quite tell. Can't, it's a little saw in shadow. So this is the, the programmer hacker dude, and this is the CIA allied agent. And then James is uh, figuring out what to do. I think it's an HK pistol is what he's got. Usually he's got a Walther. Usually James Bond is carrying a Walther PPQ or PPK. Big Walther fan. I think Walther pays a lot of money to product placement. Uh, their guns in there. Yeah, what's this guy's name? It's Seamus something, isn't it? He's a great villain, though. I liked him. He, like, he was smart. He was intelligent. Crazy, but intelligent. James Bond has a silencer on his pistol? No, when did you put a silencer on? That's a continuity error. You don't have time to put a silencer on his gun. Why would you put a silencer gun in the middle of a gunfight? Look. Con major continuity. He's got no... Yeah, he's got no silencer on his pistol there. And that dude got head capped by the bad guy. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then he's launched rockets and just completely gone off the rails. 
completely gone off the rails. I don't know what that move this is. Tomorrow Never Dies. How did that theme song go? Dr. Octopus had glasses, L says. Hey, what's up, Devin? Welcome to the house. House of Love, House of Pain. Doc Octopus had glasses. Did he have it in the Spider-Man movie? Did he wear glasses in the movie? He had like sunglasses on, right, Al? I'm trying to remember Doc Ock. Dr. Oct Mr. Freeze have glasses? Arnold's Mr. Freeze didn't have glasses, but I think I remember in the cartoon. Mr. Freeze. Dr. Freeze. Had them Jimmy James on. All right. So we want to fill this guy with some color. Let's see. Is our silhouette working well enough for us? Can I magic wand tool? Ooh, there's a little bit of a gap there. I think there's a hand guard here. And that's the palm. And then the finger kind of comes out like that. Something like that. Something like that there. The glove has a crease in it. Something like that there. Something like that there. And then we'll crop the image about where the, pho the photograph takes place. Something like that. Boom, boom, boom. Wand, magic wand tool. Looks like I have a gap. We can see that there's a gap originating from the bottom of the plate carrier around where the magazine uh, compartments are. Cool. This is fine. So once I draw over that, it should seal up now. Magic wand tool. Nope, didn't get the back. Boom. Magic wand tool. That looks pretty good. Cool. So we'll inverse select that, shrink that selection by just a little bit, modify, contract. Let's go to two pixels is fine. It will go fill with a background color. I'm going to pick the gunmetal blue here. It's a little bluish because it's reflecting some of the light of the sky. There we go. Fill the whole thing with that. And then we're going to clean up our negative space area. So we have a little bit there around the trigger guard. And then above the forearm is a gap right next to the mouth, inside of the stock. There's a little hole. Put a little bit right there just for fun. That looks pretty good. Cool. And then we can start coloring this layer. We're going to lock the transparency. And we're going to grab our tom brush. And then let's start to pick some colors and put them in. Let's see what this arm color is. Looks like a semi-desaturated, kind of middle gray level reddish color. We'll just swipe that over the limbs real fast. So we got the skin areas quickly defined. This face is probably going to be a more specific color, but we'll just mask this in for now. Probably a little bit darker for the cheek and neck which is somewhere in that area. Next, we'll get the uh, jacket. So it's this, we're going to pick an average color, probably the darker of the two. There's actually three colors going on here. We have, we have the dark of uh, the pattern, which is going to be the first color to go down, I think. That's what I would do first. arms and the torso maybe and then there is the light of the pattern and we'll just kind of mark that kind of funzy way so we're not going to spend the time to draw all this so I'm just going to do like a large pattern version of that just to communicate the idea of the garment not really represent it realistically but we're just getting the idea that it is a pattern camouflage thing. Uh-oh, my live video seems to cut out. Okay, good. Came back. And then lastly, we have just the full highlight. When we're getting more specular uh, than we're getting uh, of the pattern, we're seeing the reflection of the light over the surface, over the, the little threads that are emer emerging off the top of this garment is collecting uh, almost full value atmospheric or sunlit color 
and it's drawing over the pattern. We no longer see the pattern. We're just seeing the threads themselves at a horizontal angle that are collecting light. And it seems like there's a light kind of bluish version too. When we get into the, the cloth paint, it, paint over, we'll get more into that. That's fine. These Peltors, the headgear on the side, they have a, an olive drab, maybe brown color, not really sure. With a bit of a highlight just on the edge. His hair, they're saying a dark gray red is what this is saying right now. That's fine. That's fine with me. Feeling like G.I. Joe right now? I got no problem with that. What's the top of his head look like? It's a little browner. It's in or it's in the orange spectrum range, but desaturated. Now let's paint that kind of in. Cool. Just a little bit of that. Uh, it's a little more on his face. I think it feels more orange. What do you think? A little bit more orange on the face there. He's got more sun on his face than on his forearms, I would believe. Because I think in combat, they, they don't allow the rolled sleeves anymore. I think they want everyone wearing uh, their, their clothes long sleeve because of fire protection. The garments they wear have some anti-burn properties to them. So if you get some uh, spalling off of a ricochet target, it's going to get caught in those fibers instead of in your skin which is good, so you're not going to get burned and cut up. And if something gets caught on fire next to you, you're, you're less likely to get a bad burn from it because the garment will stop some of that heat transmission. And I guess that's pretty common um, over in the sandbox. So he's doing the rolled up thing today because he's on his range, but I'm sure while he is deployed, he ain't rolling up his sleeves that much. He's probably running around outside with his t-shirt and then most of the time full battle dress combat uniform, Air Force combat uniform. I'm making a lot of assumptions here, but I think I just think it's interesting. Not only is his face in shadow, but it's more there's more of that orange pigment in there. It's a little pinker on the forearm. And again, I think he's a uh, out of I could be wrong about this, but I thought he was a Northwesterner. Somewhere out in Oregon or Washington State. They just don't get as much sunshine as uh, we do, you know. So this is like a blue, it's a little that blue sky color. It's coming into the uh, Peltor, the headset radio. And there's a little bit of silver. There's a connector over there, probably where his microphone that's run on the opposite side has a wire that comes over and he's just tied it into the headset apparatus so it's out of the way and not dangling and running into things. But that would be plugged into a radio, which he is not wearing right now. He would have a radio either in one of the pouches of his chest rig or in his backpack. And this is pretty good for now. How are we doing on time? It's 12.46. We've got an hour in. Devin says, we lost power down here. Watch it on the phone. This wind is nasty. I agree. The wind is very nasty. It was 18 mile per hour sustained winds here yesterday evening. Wow. I hope the power comes on quick. If you guys need something, come on up here. Uh, you're welcome. I know you guys don't have the COVID. So if you need to come up to Shrewsbury... Do your grocery shopping. Uh, I can put on some TV for you guys. We can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. I can get a pizza. We could practice social distance pizza eating. It might be fun. It might be fun. It'd be a good time. Okay, and then we're going to. You guys play Zelda Breath of the Wild. I'm playing the heck out of it, and that thing is awesome. So I know this this unit in real life is a flat, dark earth tan color. But in this lighting condition, it's going blue. Why is that? Well, we have blue in our sky, in our atmosphere, and that's what it's picking up. That's what it's doing. Cool. Like I know in real life, this scope, this LCAN Spectre DR, is a middle gray. It's like a flight, a flat, grayish color. They make one that's a little bit more tan. But usually it's just anodized aluminum gray, but it's going a little bit more blue, again, for the same reasons. Cool, cool, cool. Let's go a little bit darker on the forearms. So you see how quickly we can just start to mask this thing out, and then we're communicating. It isn't rendered sharply. It isn't perfect with the lines, but it's communicating that this is a guy with a firearm, and he has these different colored garments. Lastly, he's got a camouflage multi-cam chest carrier rig thing, plate carrier rack. Uh, I'm just going to pick one of these colors, and it's going to be a dark tan, and glaze over the whole thing with that, and then I might glaze over some of those specific camouflage colors. 
just to suggest that I'm not going to do every bit, but there's some greenish in there. There's a little bit of green, and I'm just going to quickly just splotch it out here. There is a gray strap. It's going to flat gray, and then there's a lighter tan color. Well, in my mind, it's tan, but here in the photograph, color corrected, it's going to be this light green gray. I'm just going to lighten it up just a little bit more. And it's what does camouflage do? Camouflage breaks up the silhouette. That's the point of camouflage. If you want to see the evolution of camouflage, where it came about from, how it evolved, it really started on naval ships and with them painting these dazzle patterns to try to change observation of guessing what speed the enemy ship was going because speed and distance was a big deal when trying to lob shells across the great great oceans uh, and we also saw camouflage in the original snipers where did that word sniper come from well it came from the bird the snipe and english game wardens were thought to be excellent if they could go hunt down and kill the infamous snipe bird and to do that, they had to be camouflaged, and they had to be very sneaky, and very patient. So the sniper came from those who could shoot the snipe bird. And they wore these big suits that were covered in camouflage, and those were the ghillie suits that we know snipers to wear today when they're in the field. They take a bunch of burlap with some nylon webbing, and they're shoving all kinds of natural vegetation into that suit to make them blend in with the environment. And they can crawl very slowly through the underbrush, looking like just the wind is blowing the leaves around, and blowing the blades of grass, but really there's a person marching through the underbrush. Very exciting today. Okay, so this is going pretty well for now. Uh, let's flip it to see if it still makes sense. Image, image rotation, flip horizontally. Let's see, how does he look? He looks pretty good. Nothing glaringly wrong. The magazine seems to have a bit of a curve to it. Let's take the uh, line work here, and we're going to paint over the line work so it's less solid black and white. We're just going to pick the colors of whatever's locally there and kind of paint into the line work some of the color that we have. Why are we doing that? Uh, just so we have like highlights on the top of stuff. It'll be clear for the viewer. So we're going to lighten up the top edge. So painting into the line layer. I think this will feel pretty good. Cool on the barrel, muzzle brake, muzzle extension device thing there. That's pretty cool. And then we'll paint over the magazine. Magazine, just a little bit lighter, it's just fun. Okay, cool. Surfaces that are looking up, get that highlight area, and then the forearm. That's pretty good. The glove. What else do we want to hit while we're here? Let's do the little highlight on the metal part of the ear pieces. Back the layer underneath, brown there. Pretty cool. All right, we can merge these two together. Let's do that. Boom. So we have him in the foreground as a line and color layer, and then it's just a little straightforward for me to fix some of those lines. The magazine's coming up and down. Something like that. Boom. Boom. So this is now weird for me because this gun is now looking like a left-handed gun with the ejection port on the opposite side. It's a little weird because guns have are not symmetrical typically. They usually have the either left-handed or right-handed design because for the control interfaces, for the thumbs, and then for the charging action, whether it's on the back or right or left. A couple co gun companies like Heckler & Koch is actually pretty good, their G36 design, but the rounds either eject out the right side or the left side. Very seldomly is it straight down or straight forward or straight up. Usually it's left or right. So that ejection port, what side that's on, tells a lot about the nature of this firearm. And if it's for a left-handed shooter or a right-handed shooter. So uh, let's flip that back. It looks pretty good. looks good enough, so we'll, we'll turn that guy back around. Image, image rotation, flip horizontal. 
Let's bring the background back up to 100%. See how it feels. Let's crop it down. Uh, yeah, something like there. Something like there. Let's compose it so that his eyeball is right at the corner of one of those thirds. That looks pretty good like that. This is feeling pretty great. I love the color. Like, kind of by accident, we have probably the, actually it's not by accident. It's the, the source image we took from the has been color corrected in a way so that the background colors and what he's wearing are the same hue, same color. Or maybe he's just got some good choices and he's chosen to wear garments that blend in with the environment. But we're seeing similarities in skin tone and color too. Skin tone and the brown in the background kind of similar and also in similar proportions too. the amount of skin we're seeing on him is, is less than the whole but the whole of the background has these lights middles darks a lot of this dark green that is similar to what he's wearing on his uh, coat really cool cinematography done for this video and it translates into a pretty good painting so if you're looking for something to inspire you to make your color studies, you know, load up a movie, load up some Fincher or some Wes Anderson, some Steven Spielberg, you know, and pick your favorite scene from those movies and do a color study just based on it. And just think about maybe shape and line work aren't as important, but sample what those colors are from a movie you like and then paint those down and in that process of sampling from a photograph or a still frame from a movie maybe it's Jaws maybe it's Jurassic Park uh, maybe it's uh, Grant uh, I'm thinking of a Wes Anderson movie Ronald Tannenbaum has some really great color key you know, Life Aquatic has some really great color choices in it if you want to uh, you know maybe an animated movie like a Pixar movie like uh, Coco or um, Moana or Toy Story all very vibrant colorful movies cars but pretty amazing and I think you'll have a really good time. And I think in painting those scenes, you realize how desaturated most of those shots really are. That very rarely do you get full saturation out of a color. So um, that the filmmakers and the artists can save that full saturation for like the most important things, the, the biggest moments, the most important little notes, will get that kind of saturation. So this is this is a fun conversation today. Let me see what you guys are what you're uh, commenting on. Devin says, don't know if that's really cool or really creepy. Oh, he's referring to his former statement. Wow, when you just said, hope your power comes back on, the light in front of the front of me flashed on. We are back in business. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Glad you have power again. I'm going to wrap this guy up. So what would I do to wrap up this image and call it done? Uh, first and foremost, I would get rid of some of these hard lines in the body itself, like this forearm, look at the reference, and then look back here, look at the reference, look back here. <laughs> Hello ladies, look at your man, now look at me, now look at your man, now look at me. What's in my hand? Diamonds. I love those Old Spice commercials, those are great. Let's take this pink. Pick it up a little bit, more saturated, paint over that edge in the forearm. Looks like his gloves are actually a two-tone, where there's a darker, unsaturated, grayer version of that brown. And then there's a more saturated, lighter knuckle version of that brown. You see how I make a mark, and then I see if it works or not, and I come back to the color to maybe hit it up. The saturation and brightness goes in a diagonal to the upper right. Pretty cool. Yeah, there's a lot of different specific mounting hardware and things on this scope. Probably not going to get into it for the sake of this drawing. I could explain it, but it'll take too long. These uh, One of the faults of the Elcan Spectre line is the mounting solution itself isn't as tight, so the zero isn't as consistent as some of the other competitors. The Trigicon, Aimpoint. But no one does that quick throw one to six or one to four one and a half to six type thing. Little flare on the nostril there. We're gonna keep the noses a little bit pinker. Just kind of reads better. You know how people wear makeup to really accentuate sexuality or uh, 
character or something like that. We're going to throw a little bit more color into Mr. Grantham here to liven him up a little bit too. So pink uh, around the nose makes him just a little bit more human, less sculptural, more uh, fleshy, right? It's a little on the pink on the eye. It's probably too light. Let's go dark for the side of the eye there. It's a really similar color to the skin around it. There's not a lot of contrast there, so we might pump up the contrast just for ourselves. And then it's really dark in the eye pocket there. And we're getting more of the glass too, the glass of his um, safety glasses. Let's get that silhouette. There's a little air gap underneath his hair there. So we can see his frow. Brow? Frow? Something. Out there. That's cool. Kind of gray and dark up here. So I make some marks and then I sample whatever that color is. Something like that. And this dark hair color, which would be this dark desaturated um, brown here. It looks like a little bit of that blue is getting into the hair also. A little bit of that blue shadow is, is here. We have a nice character defining lock of hair there. Almost a, there's almost a clear edge between the blue and the light highlight. There's a little hair there, and there's a big mass of color on the top. I get a strap. Sometimes those little details occasionally give us uh, joy, right? And they define what the shape is. We have more of that pink light coming off the top. Just desaturated just a little bit more for the leather headband that's up on top of around this. Uh, radio unit. And then there's an indicator for that cable. Warm, cool, and then the metallic connector bit. Looks like it's a couple different kinds of metal. Maybe it's like an aluminum and a steel. Not really sure, but we can change the color just a little bit. And there's some cabling. So it's got a warm side and then it's got a cool side. Oh, cool. So something like that. That feels pretty good. Shadow area here. Anywhere we can mass, just mass a big shadow, it's going to make it easier on us. Let's make the broad strokes. I want to warm up this highlight just a little bit. Looking at the shape of this fold system. Looks like an upside down A, doesn't it? So I'm sampling the local colors and then painting over with better shapes, more correct, more accurate shapes for what we want this thing to do. Am I mixing stuff up? It seems like I might be getting confused and mixing a few, a few shapes up at the same time. Can always be careful of that. So I'm looking around the outside. And looking back inside again, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside. Keep bouncing back and forth. Does this work? Does this make sense? Might be a little too pink. That highlight. It's looking more like the skin tone. So I'm seeing that this whole area is, compared to the rest of the body, it's too close to that skin. So what am I going to do? I think I'll make it yellower. So we'll just grab the yellow color and we'll go to a, a hue, maybe like a hue type. Just glaze over that. And so it's it's keeping the tonality, but it's just changing the hue of that. Yeah, that feels a little, a little better. I don't think it's perfect yet, but it's not as obnoxious as it was before. It's fine. All right, so we have a little bit of a highlight. We have a shape that does a little bit of a lightning bolt here and a shadow. So that sleeve is pretty baggy and it comes down pretty pretty deep. So then there's a swooping fold, comes into a broader crease there. So 
So if we squint our eyes, the highlight to shadow is a greater difference than the pattern of the garment. The textile, I should say. Right, in this shape of the fold, I love this fold. There's a crease, this is on top of the shoulder, and then it cuts downward. A little bit of a highlight there. So this thing comes across. Right on a little bit. It's feeling better. Shadow in there. Shadow, shadow, shadow. There's a bit of a highlight at this point. Let's get that shape just right. Just right. Let's get the airbrush back out. Soften some of this stuff a little bit. It might help with the clarity if it's just a little bit softer and blended and less hard edged. Something like that. So there's a little smaller crease here. That's good. This thing thins out. Blends there. Round soft there. Okay, that feels good. So this shape does something like that, darken the inside of it, and then there's a crease. Is that right? No. We have the big hollow, and this line comes down softly, the edge up, and then this goes to the corner. It goes to the corner and down. Good. That feels nice. And then a little bit of a highlight there. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Something like that feels pretty good. Now I might take, you can take this pattern, you can try to warp the pattern over the surface if you want. I might just suggest the pattern really lightly. I'm just going to go a little darker, maybe 50% on my mark. By hitting 5, go to 50. And then just draw. What am I on? What mode am I on? That's a racer. Let's brush 50% in and then just kind of do some kind of line work just to suggest that there is some kind of pattern here and just making a bunch of wiggly lines to kind of go across the surface of this thing just to suggest that there's a pattern and then up the other direction too. I don't have a lot of time for this but just trying to visualize the haptic the surface as I'm drawing these lines. So it's going to roll a little bit over the highlights. And then we'll redraw over the most hit highlight, the, high, the highest highlight of the areas doesn't really have much of that pattern at all. So we'll just come back over top of that to paint in, paint over that pattern, see what that feels like. And it feels okay. Is it great? Nah, it's not great. But it's something. And we're, we're talking about speed, speed being the key here. What is that highlight color? If we picked it, what do we get? It's, a, it's almost flat gray. It's really close to flat gray. I was thinking that it was a, a warmer sun color but now that I'm actually picking it, this is warmer. This is actually pretty pink. It's like a white pinkish color back there. Isn't that interesting? I'm, I'm surprised how desaturated it is. So we're just going to come back over the desaturated color for that highlight. Get a deep fold crease in here. A little darker there, go 100%. It's pretty cool. And then we have some tight folds up at the top. It's interesting that we some have some cool highlights and some warm highlights. That's very interesting. 
We have the big highlight coming over the top and the smaller one here. All right, something like that. What do you guys think? What do you think? We're coming along. I don't want to spend too much more time here. Let's give a little bit of a highlight to his cheek. Something like that. It goes a little purple or bluish inside the glasses. There's a little bit of a hue very subtly on the glasses. So just, just a little bit there. Nothing much. A little hair. It's cool. A little extension of his face. I think his chin's there. It's pretty good. Underside of that stock. A little bit of a highlight fuzziness. It's coming across there. His garment actually comes up, I think, like the neck of his uniform. It's crossing up in that direction. It looks very similar to his chin color, chin and neck color, something like that. Looks pretty good. That's cool. So this is a flap of fabric over here. It's kind of coming around the gun. Might be a strap. I'm not really. I'm not sure what that is. And uh, frankly, I'm not going to get into it because I want to get on with my day. You know, get on with my day. And we have a big highlight going over the top here. And you guys want to get on with your day too. I'm not trying to hold you up. I'm trying to get you fired up. Let's go. Let's do something. Let's make a thing. Cool. There's some bolts. And uh, this is mostly pretty good. Mostly pretty good. And in life, that's I think all we should really hope for is mostly pretty okay. You know, if you set your standards too high, you're never going to accomplish anything. Nothing's ever going to be done. Sometimes you just got to say, good enough, time to move on. We'll change the, care, the color of the bolt just a little bit. Just to give it a little more contrast in there. This is good. It's pretty good. Go back to the sharp, sharper edged brush. And uh, it's pretty cool. It's got a little thingy there. A little marking of some kind. It's actually a little bit of the hollow there. There we go, just a little bit. Get a little bit of a shadow here. Cool, cool. Good enough. Dark enough. There's a button back here. Some kind of smaller button here. And then there's a big pressure switch up here. Pressure button. All kinds of buttons. Soft button, there's some labeling. Yeah, I don't know. This is this is pretty good though. Not gonna go too not gonna go nuts. If you want to highlight the fingertips just a little bit, this brown color is too much. So we'll desaturate it a little. A little bit of skin there. And then the tips of the fingers are just catching a little bit more light than the rest of the finger is. Just a little highlight on the top. Just a little hit. That's all you need. It looks like the thumb's on top. I actually missed that before. Over the top of the gun, the thumb is wrapping on this side. Probably to hit some kind of pressure switch up there that controls a flashlight. Maybe. Pretty good, man. Oh, pretty good. So I think this was a lot of fun. This got me going today. I'm going to do some 3D modeling after this. Have some phone calls. Catch up with all my peers and friends. And I hope everyone out there is doing good in the COVID hood. Doing good, good in the COVID hood. I mean, what, what more can you ask for? Are you getting by today? I like that this idea. Hopefully that the next... 20 years of our civilization, uh, we won't be so competitive with each other. As long as everyone's getting by, hopefully it's still going to be, like, that's kind of good enough. Like, you're getting by, you got some money in the bank, you're feeding, your sit, you're feeding yourself, feeding your kids, you're taking care of each other, being nice to people, just being happy to see faces. Hopefully this makes us all appreciate each other a little bit more. 
and uh, you know the feel of human contact. We're reminded how good that is, and how loving um, we can be to each other. Let's all be a little nicer after all this. That would be nice. It would be nice if we're all just a little bit nicer. So Grand Thumb is telling us to uh, don't mess around, otherwise we'll get gatted by him and his posse and his crew. But I think this was a fun, quick uh, drawing, demo, fan art today. And I'm going to be putting this up somewhere and trying to get some likes. Thanks again for tuning in. Thanks, Devin, L, Savannah, and Sean for commenting. Your comments get me excited and make me draw better. Just keep doing it. Share, subscribe, like, send love messages. Send me love letters. I love love letters. Haven't got one in a long time. Just be like, dear, dear Tom, you're lovely today. I like that flannel shirt you got from L.L. Bean in Maine two years ago. <laughs> uh, don't send it to me. Send it to someone who needs it. I'm good. Send you send a love letter to somebody who needs to be told I love you on a Friday. Take care.